Hey Optimancers, Chris here. In my last video I discussed the new optional class features for Sorcerers in Tasha's Cauldron of Everything, as well as the new Aberrant Mind Sorcerer subclass. I also discussed some of the drawbacks of playing a Sorcerer that I think are well addressed, in some cases dramatically, with these new options. I'll be linking that video in the video description, so if you haven't watched it yet, I recommend you check it out first, as I'll be referencing it a couple times in this video. Today I'm going to go over the Clockwork Soul Sorcerer, and as with the Aberrant Mind Sorcerer, I think this subclass is miles ahead of the other Sorcerer subclasses for anyone who's taking more than a few levels of Sorcerer. One thing I think that's particularly exciting about the Clockwork specifically is that you can put together a list of spells known that is particularly tasty, and I'm going to go over that later in this video. If you would like to support what I do with these videos, I'll be linking my Patreon page in the video description. Patrons are provided early access to ad-free versions of these videos, and my top-level patrons join me for a casual one-shot D&D session each month. So let's get started. So the Clockwork Soul Sorcerer is presented as a sorcerer that has been touched by the machinations of a plane like Mechanis and the Modron race or something similar. For those of you who are unfamiliar with Modrons, they are a race of constructs who are the epitome of law and order more than any other race in the multiverse. Maybe the exception of the Formians. The ultimate caste society, each Modron is represented by a geometric shape that denotes their place in the hierarchy. Modrons value logic over compassion, guilt, envy, hatred, or any of the other weak emotions of other races. Think Spock, only more so. Much, much more so. So this should give us some ideas for character concept, pretty easily actually. A clockwork soul sorcerer stereotypically should value logic, disdain emotion, and be interested in the most efficient solution to a problem, regardless of other factors. Alignment, lawful, neutral, 100%. Maybe this can create some interesting role-playing opportunities, as your character might suggest tactics or solutions to challenges that might sound horrific or abhorrent to the other characters. And then you can be confused as to why they would insist on a less efficient solution. I think overall the features of this subclass represent well the theme, so let's go over them. The first, and by far the best feature that a Clockwork Sorcerer receives is Clockwork Magic. Like with the Psionic Spells feature of the Aberrant Mind Sorcerer, this is a massive ability that gets better and better and better. Expect your 10th level Clockwork Sorcerer to have approximately twice the known spells of a Sorcerer from another subclass, unless it is an Aberrant Mind, of course. At 1st, 3rd, 5th, 7th, and ninth level, we're going to get two additional spells known. This is on a class that normally is only getting one spell known per level. On its surface, this looks a lot like the domain spell feature that clerics get, which is a great ability on its own, but this is a lot better because when we don't like a spell we've received here, we can switch it out, and it can be switched out to any abjuration or transmutation spell from the Sorcerer, Warlock, or Wizard spell list. So I want to reference the Barrent Mind Sorcerer again for a moment, because if you remember, they could switch out their Psionic spells from another from either the Divination or Enchantment schools. Being able to switch to Abjuration or Transmutation doesn't mean that we just have more switch out options here, but those options are actually a lot better. By 10th level, we can totally expect to have 10 really great spells known in addition to our regular spells. This is massive, and again, I'll be going over this in more detail later in this video. There are some thematic suggestions thrown in here if you need some ideas for what happens when you cast one of your spells. Suggestions include spectral cog wheels appearing behind you, hands of a clock spinning in your eyes, a brassy sheen glowing off your skin, geometric shapes appearing on your body, you get the idea. My next clockwork sorcerer will probably have mathematical equations appearing in the air around them, you know, like Alan in The Hangover. 
except unlike Alan, my character will actually be good at it. We get another first ability as well, and this is called Restore Balance, which is certainly thematically appropriate for the subclass. A number of times equal to your proficiency bonus each day, you can cancel out advantage or disadvantage on any type of roll. So it could be an attack roll, it could be an ability check, it could be a saving throw, whatever. For yourself or another creature you can see within 60 feet of you. I think this one is probably okay, but not as good as it sounds. In my experience, advantage on a roll tends to be awarded to PCs more often than enemies, and disadvantage hinders enemies more often than PCs. In any case where advantage and disadvantage are already cancelling each other out, this ability doesn't do anything. So I'm not saying this ability will never come up. I just think it's probably not going to come up as often as we might initially guess. Still, I think this ability is okay. At 6th level, we get Bastion of Law. This one provides a new way to spend sorcery points, and I think a pretty good one. You can spend 1 to 5 sorcery points and create a magical ward around yourself or someone else that will reduce damage taken. And there are a few nice things about this mechanically. The first is, this isn't an increase to hit points, nor is it temporary hit points, so it will stack with either or both. You start stacking temporaries with aid spells and this, and you'll have a pretty massive buffer before damage starts working its way through to your actual hit points. The second nice thing here is that it's not hit points and not treated as hit points, which means you can use this buffer to reduce concentration save DCs or eliminate the saves entirely. The third nice thing here, and this one is nice and unique, is that we can choose when to use this buffer. This is unlike the Abjurer's Ward or temporary hit points or extra hit points, and it's something I think that's not immediately apparent to people who read this casually. When the stakes are low, you can let the damage go through, but when you cast that very important concentration spell, you can use this to help keep that concentration up. I probably wouldn't use the dice on side battles, but save it up for the big baddie, and you don't always know when that's going to happen, but with this ability, that doesn't matter. When you need it, you've got it. The fourth nice thing is that we can reuse this ability if it does get used. We need to spend sorcery points again, but that might be worth considering. So overall, I think this is a very nice 6th level ability. Now to be clear, I don't think it's as nice as all the goodies that the Aberrant Mind gets at 6th level, but I still think it's a good ability nonetheless. That brings us up to high level, and at 14th level we get Trance of Order. Traditionally at this level, Sorcerer subclasses get something really awesome. What this does is we use a bonus action to activate the state, which lasts for one minute, or likely one combat. While we're in this state, attack rolls against us cannot benefit from advantage, and as I previously mentioned, this probably isn't a big deal, even less so since we could already eliminate that advantage using our reaction. Though admittedly, our reaction is more valuable at this level. Also, we don't have the 60-foot restriction, but as I previously said, this just isn't coming up all that much. Second thing that happens is whenever we make an attack roll, which at this level isn't happening often either, or an ability check, or a saving throw, you can treat a roll of 9 or lower on the d20 as a 10. Now we're talking. This is really good. You know what uses ability checks? Counterspell. Dispel magic. This means they're automatically going to work on spells up to level 5, assuming a 20 charisma. If we have something else that adds to our ability checks, we might even be more than that. But you know what's better though? Telekinesis. A guaranteed roll of 10 or higher is going to improve the reliability of restraining creatures with telekinesis significantly. The reliability on saving throws is huge too. Concentration DCs are often higher than 10 when we reach this level. You're probably looking at a con save of plus 7 or plus 8 by this point, so you could automatically save a concentration after taking 35 points of damage. If you take more than that, remember you could use Bastion of Law to bring that down. Considering the concentration saves this sorcerer in particular might be making, this is really, really good. And we'll get more into that when we talk about the spells known list. Now once you use this ability, if you want to use it again before a long rest, it's going to require a pretty big 5 sorcery points to use it again, though having the option is nice and it might be worth it. 
Finally, we get our 18th level feature, which is called Clockwork Cavalcade. This requires our action, and it affects a 30-foot cube around us. The first thing is it restores up to 100 hit points, and we can divide it as we choose among the creatures in the cube, including us. As I've mentioned with the Mass Heal spell, the ability to divide healing as we choose is really good. 100 hit points, it's no Mass Heal, but it's still a lot of hit points, and something a sorcerer normally can't do. The second is, any damaged objects in the cube are instantly repaired. Obviously, this is circumstantial and perhaps utility, but I can think of campaigns where this kind of thing could be a game changer, especially if this works on things like artifacts. But I gotta say, I would be checking with my DM before I assume any such thing. Just because this doesn't say that it doesn't work on artifacts doesn't mean it does. Finally, any spell of 6th level or lower ends on creatures or objects of your choice within the cube. Unlike Dispel Magic, this can affect multiple targets. So overall, I think this is a good ability. We can use it once per long rest, though we can use it again by spending 7 sorcery points. That's expensive, but for 100 hit points of healing, that might be worth it for that alone. So overall, I'd say this is a pretty decent ability, even for the level. So that takes us through all the subclass features, so let's dig into those extra spells known. At first level we get Alarm and Protection from Evil and Good, and you know what? I'd switch them both out easy. Right away we see how the access of Abjuration and Transmutation is significantly superior to Divination and Enchantment. The issue isn't finding a spell to replace these ones with, the issue becomes narrowing it down to just two. I mean, listen to these options. We have the option of Absorb Elements. This is definitely a spell I want on my Sorcerer. Then we have Mage Armor, and if I don't wear armor, I want this spell. Then we have Shield, one of the best first level spells in the game. I want this one too. And then, get this, we have Armor of Agathis. Stacking this with Bastion of Law is nasty, and normally not available to Sorcerers. So, I think I would take this one for sure. So lots of options we would have picked even if we could have selected any school. And that takes us to our second level spells. Aid and Lesser Restoration. So stop right there, keep Aid. That's a terrific spell that's normally not available to sorcerers. It's going to stack with your Armor of Agathis as well as with Bastion of Law. Now Lesser Restoration is okay, but I think we can do better. I think there's a clear winner at this level, and that's Levitate. Great spell available for switch out, and also if you have twin spell, it's a great spell to twin. So now we're on to level 3. We have Dispel Magic, which is a good spell, and Protection from Energy, which is so-so. So our options here include Counterspell, Fly, Haste, Slow, Tiny Servant, so many choices. Aberrant Mind has a distinct lack of options at this level, but we have a great list. So, I hope you were able to choose, because we are going to move on to level 4. We get Freedom of Movement, which is okay, but circumstantial, and Summon Construct. And again, like I mentioned in my last video, summoning and sorcerers is something that normally just doesn't happen. So it is tempting to keep that. However, Banishment and Polymorph, they're both available here. Personally, I would switch Freedom of Movement for Polymorph, and I might keep the Summon. And that takes us to level 5, and this one is the standout. We get Greater Restoration, and that's a pretty good spell that is normally not available for Warlocks. And wait for it, Wall of Force. Yes, the best 5th level spell in the game that 9th level Sorcerers dream of in a jealous fury is here. If you switch this one out, the Modrons are coming for you. They are coming for you. As for Greater Restoration, I could see switching that out, and although there are some good options like Animate Objects and Telekinesis here, I think I would grab Telekinesis with my Sorcerer slots personally. The switch here has to be Transmute Rock. Again, a great spell that does not use Concentration, and it's normally not available to Sorcerers. So what we end up with, for example, is first level Shield and Armor of Agathis, 2nd level, Aid and Levitate. 3rd level, Counterspell and Tiny Servant, because Constructs, come on. 4th level, Polymorph and Summon Construct. 
and fifth level wall of force and transmute rock. This is a spell list any 10th level sorcerer could only dream of and we haven't even taken our sorcerer spells yet. So yeah, I want to play a Clockwork Sorcerer, and I definitely think that Tasha's was extremely good to the Sorcerer. And I have to say that both subclasses are really amazing, though in significantly different ways. That said, I am going to say one thing here that is disappointing to me. Clockwork Sorcerers, unfortunately, like all Sorcerers, are using Charisma as their casting stat. I really think if there's any Sorcerer that should not be using Charisma, this is the one. This should be using intelligence, right? But you can talk to your DM about that. If I was your DM, I'd have no problem with it. It's certainly not unbalanced, and I think it's just more thematically appropriate for the idea of the theme of this subclass. But that's all I really have to say about Sorcerers today. So let's move on to discuss, wait for it, clerics in our next videos. Talk about classes that Tasha's was good to. And if we think that sorcerers did well, we need to stand in awe at how good they were to the cleric. So I hope you'll join me as our collective jaws drop as we go over what the designers apparently thought wasn't game-breaking. So until then, I'm going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D&D &D is for everyone. Thanks, everyone, and I'll talk to you soon.